Hi, today I'm going to explain RSA encryption, which is the typical algorithm that your computer uses to send encoded messages across the internet. First, let me use an example to explain the purpose of RSA. Let's say you want to pass a secret message to your friend in class. If you just write your message on a piece of paper and the teacher sees it, she could read it. And perhaps she'll read it out loud to the entire class, which could be terribly embarrassing. The point is, you don't want your teacher to be able to read it. So what you can do is encode your message. Here's a simple encryption method where each letter is represented by its spot in the alphabet and space is 27. Then you can encrypt your message and your friend can decrypt it by doing the reverse of what you did. But if your teacher intercepts the note, she won't be able to read it unless she knows how to decode it. Now, let's say you're a bank and you want people to send you their bank information safely. If everyone uses the same encryption method, that is, everyone gets the same key to lock their bank information, then one person could use their key to unlock somebody else's lock and steal their money. This simply won't do. And it wouldn't be feasible to give every one of our thousands of clients their own special key in person. What we need is a method that is easy to lock but hard to unlock. And this is what RSA is for. RSA works like a padlock, where everyone can put the padlock on their private information, but only the bank has the key to unlock the padlock. So if someone tries to steal someone else's information, they won't have the key. You depend on RSA every day to keep your information secure. Banks use it, Google, Amazon, Facebook. The modern world depends on RSA. If RSA were broken, all of your information stored on these websites could be stolen, which would have a catastrophic effect on both your security and the world's. So now that we know why RSA is so important, let's take a look at how it works. But first, we must learn modular arithmetic, also known as clock arithmetic. Luckily, you already have a basic understanding of clock arithmetic. Let me give you an example. If Bob goes to work at 9 o'clock and then works for 8 hours, what time does he get home at? That's right, 5 o'clock. But 9 plus 8 equals 17, not 5. However, we can notice that 17 is equal to 12 plus 5. And on a 12-hour clock, every time we count up to 12 hours, we reset our count back to 0. So we can effectively ignore the 12 because it gets reset back to 0. And this is what modular arithmetic is. If we ignore all the mouthfuls of 12, then 17 is the same as 5. We say this as 17 is congruent to 5 mod 12. And we can express, it, express this using an equal sign with an extra dash. The nice thing is we can easily calculate these congruences because when 17 is divided by 12, the remainder is 5. We can generalize this idea for clocks with any number of hours, say n. We reduce a number x mod n by finding the remainder when x is divided by n. And here's an example problem. Reduce 487 mod 32. To solve this problem, we can just use long division. And here's the work. Since the remainder is 7, we know that 487 is congruent to 7 mod 32. However, in the RSA algorithm, we'll be using absolutely massive, massive numbers. At that point, we need to use a calculator to solve these problems. And I recommend Wolfram Alpha because it's free and powerful. So here's another sample problem. Since these numbers are too large to reasonably calculate by hand, we will simply ask Wolfram Alpha to do it for us. And Wolfram Alpha just gives us the answer. So we know that 809 to the 5 is congruent to 1,553 mod 4,692, thanks to Wolfram Alpha. So now that we understand modular arithmetic, we can move on to learn RSA encryption. Let's say someone wants to send us an encrypted message so that only we can decode it, even though everyone knows we're using RSA. What we're going to do is pick two large prime numbers, P and Q, and we're going to multiply them to get another large number, n. We'll let everyone know what n is, but ideally, we picked n to be so large that modern computers cannot prime factorize it to find p and q. And so you can keep track of them. We'll let all the private numbers be red and all the public ones be green. Then we calculate the Euler totient function of n, which is called phi, using a formula phi equals p minus 1 times q minus 1. And we'll also keep phi a secret. We then pick an encryption key, E, so that the greatest common divisor of E and phi is 1, and that E is between 1 and phi. E is called our public key. E is the padlock that people put on their information to lock it before they send it to us. We then calculate another integer, D, called the decryption key, using the formula E times D is congruent to 1 mod phi. We can also write this as E times D is 1 more than some multiple of phi. We can find D using the Euclidean algorithm. But nobody else will be able to find D, since they don't know what phi is. And we'll explain what the Euclidean algorithm is later. D is called the private key. In the analogy, it's the bank's key. So now someone can encode their message, which we'll call M, using the public key by finding M to the E and then reducing it mod N. The result of this will be C, which is the encoded message. 
and that's what they're going to send to us across the internet. Just to note, our computer can calculate C quickly using the exponentation by squaring algorithm. But we don't have time to, to discuss that right now. Now we can decode the message they just sent us using our decryption key. So if we take C to the D and reduce that mod N by some amazing feat of mathematics, <laughs> we get the original message M back. Now since anyone knows what N and E are, anyone can encrypt a message. But we're the only ones who know D, so only we can decrypt it. Bank, for example, then anyone can encode their bank information, but only we can decode it. If someone just knows C, they can't find M without knowing D. And that's the key to RSA encryption. So that's a lot to take in all at once. So I recommend you pause the video here and go over the steps until you understand them. And now we're going to move on to an example. Let's say that for some strange reason, your friend wants to secretly send us a message, hi. Now the first thing we have to do is turn the message into an integer. And we'll use the same letter shift we used before. And the result is that our message is equal to 809. So it's important that M is less than N, because otherwise RSA encryption won't work. So now we can use RSA encryption. Step one, we're going to pick two large primes, and I chose 47 and 103. And then we're going to calculate N as their product, 4,841. Step two is to calculate B, which is P minus 1 times Q minus 1. And the result of that is 4,692. Then we get to pick a number E, and I picked 5 because the GCD of 5 and 4,692 is 1, and we can verify that with the calculator. Step 3 is to solve for the decryption key, D, and we use this equation, e to the D is equal to 1 mod phi. Now if we plug those numbers into a calculator, we get that D is equal to 1,877. That's our decryption key. Now our friend can encode their message. We're going to tell everyone what N and E are. So our friend can encode their message by finding m to the e and then reducing it mod n. And if they plug in those values, they find that their encrypted message is 971. So that's what they're going to send to us. They're going to send to us the number 971. And what we're going to do with that is we're going to raise it to the dth power. So if we take 971 and raise it to the 1877th power and then reduce it mod n, we should get back our original message m. And if we plug that into a calculator, we do we get 809. And that just shows the power of RSA. We got the original message back, and no one would be able to steal the message. So now let's go over the last example using a diagram. First, we calculate all the private numbers, P, Q, B, and D, and send our friend the public numbers, N and E. Our friend will use those, along with his original message, M, to calculate C, the encrypted message. And they'll send that back over the internet to us. We'll take the encrypted message and decrypt it using D and we'll get back the original message, M. Now, if someone wants to come along and steal our information, they, all they have to use is N, E, and C. But that's not enough information to find M, because they won't be able to factorize N. In the real world, we use really, really large values for N. For example, this value of N has over 600 digits. Your computer probably has lots of large numbers, such as this one stored on it, for the purpose of RSA encryption. And it just isn't feasible to factor this number with modern technology. This begs the question, is RSA in danger of being cracked? Short answer is, no, not right now. Since the largest n value crack so far had 155 digits, and most companies use much larger values for n. However, quantum computers do pose a sizable threat to RSA because of Shor's algorithm, which is a very fast algorithm for factoring large numbers on a quantum computer. If quantum computers ever do become more common, we will need to th rethink RSA to keep our information secure. You also may be wondering, why does RSA encryption work? What's the math behind it? The key is something called Euler's, function, or Euler's theorem, which lets us prove that c to the dth power reduces back to m mod n. And you can pause here if you want to understand the algebra. Finally, I said before that we can calculate d using the extended Euclidean algorithm. This algorithm lets us find the GCD of any two integers in logarithmic time, which is very fast to a computer. So the Euclidean algorithm uses repeated applications of the quotient and remainder theorem, which is shown here, to form a cascading chain of remainders until the end result is the GCD. We can then reverse these equations, like so, and use them to solve equations of the form e times d is equal to 1 plus k phi, like in step 3 of RSA. I also recommend that you test what you've learned by trying some of these sample problems, and the answers are in the description. You may want to use this cheat sheet to help you. Finally, if you want to learn more about any of the topics we didn't have time to cover, check out these links below.
Thanks for watching and catch you later.